Welcome to week 10, where we are going to talk about climate change. Now, in addition to uh, the two videos that I have made for this week, I have links to a few videos made by ESF, uh, Environmental School of Forestry in Syracuse, New York, and also um, some podcasts that you will be listening to from the Science Friday website. So make sure you check those out along with uh, these two videos. So the first video, we're going to talk about um, what our knowledge of past climate change is based on. So how do we know things have changed in the past? What do we use? Uh, and then in video two, we'll discuss past climate change, uh, how it's changed throughout Earth's history, why it's changed throughout her Earth's history, and then what might happen in the future. So the knowledge that we have today about climate change uh, is based on numerous different items. And the nice thing about these different items is some of these uh, are more recent and more detailed. Some go further back in Earth's history. And a lot of these overlap with one another. So we have more than one uh, piece of evidence uh, to rely on. So we can kind of cross check between each of these. So the uh, first one we'll talk about is historical records, and we'll get into biological evidence, then glacial, and then geological, which kind of fit together there. So historical records, um, there's lots and lots and lots of data out there, which I think a lot of you have found out at this point in the term. Um, NOAA has tons and tons of information about uh, past weather observations for various cities. You can also get data from not only weather stations, like you see here, that are currently recording weather, maybe go back um, 100, 200 years. But we also have ship records, which go back even further, maybe even 17th century. And narratives, oral tradition, so um, there's a lot of uh, maybe farmers, almanacs, diaries, things like that, that can give us some information about how um, what the weather or climate was like in the past. So uh, some of these items are kind of just small snippets of history. Um, we can also be taking measurements, like I mentioned before, with the weather stations to measure the various uh, weather elements like you've been looking at. Um, these measurements go back to the 17th century, like I mentioned before, with those ship logs and, and other uh, diaries and whatnot. The monitoring of uh, the globe began in the 1800s, so we have some records going back that far. And then current satellite monitoring, so the, the satellite images that we have produced today, that's been going on since about the 1960s. So the positive side of this is quantitative information, it's more precise. Negative side is it only shows a brief part of Earth's climate history, so the last 200 years. Some other historical record information, so um, some of these items, um, like you can see here, is an old climate station um, history that's actually handwritten. So a lot of this data, data is very old. Um, s much of it has been scanned. Um, so we have lots of this, this um, these old papers and not a lot of electronic stuff. And a lot of this information would have been taken from stations like you see here on the rooftop in Minnesota. So. Some of these uh, documents can go back to Roman times if we have um, maybe pictures, sketches, diaries, oral tradition, things like that. They can go back pretty far. So the positive side of this, we get major events, so large scale uh, events for the past 4,000 years. So we don't necessarily have the day to day change, but we have big events. Um, the negative side is these are limited to those major events and can be highly subjective. So there's, uh, using this, these historical records can be uh, a little dicey depending on what you're looking at. So you want to know the limitations of the data that you're using. So biological evidence, um, one piece uh, that is used are tree rings. So this is the um, growth of a tree over time. Every year we get a new ring formed in this tree, we can tell a few different things from this. The first is we can tell how wet or dry um, that year was, depending on how thick each ring is. Wetter, thicker, drier, thinner, so we can have more growth when the conditions are favorable, less growth when there's not. Um, 
And we can also correlate some of these rings if we have uh, enough data. So for instance, uh, we have these bristlecone, bristlecone pines that we see in California. Some of these bristlecone pines are 9,000 years old. So a ton of information stored in one of those trees. So what we can do is we can take one of these trees, take a core sample of this tree, get the tree ring information, and then what can be done is if there's maybe buried trees nearby that are um, maybe in a glacial deposit or in old cave dwellings, a dead tree, and what scientists can do and actually correlate tree rings over time because if these trees were all living at the same time, we would see very similar conditions in the same area. So our tree ring thickness would be the same over the same time frame. Um, we can also use radiocarbon dating to date the trees that are uh, dead. So we can take dead trees that are fossilized um, in deposits and then match them up to current ones using this technique, which is pretty cool. Um, some other biological evidence include pollens and lake varves. So um, throughout each year, if you have a, a lake environment, this kind of crude drawing here, these are all, all these images we're using are from uh, NOAA. So this would, it shows you a few different things. Um, in this lake, every year there's a series of layers that are, are deposited. So we have winter and, and summer layers that are deposited and then anything in the atmosphere that lands on this lake surface is going to sink to the bottom and end up in that layer. So some items could be ash from forest fires, also pollen from trees, brush, um, any other vegetation that's nearby. So in these layers, as long as this lake is undisturbed at the bottom, these layers are preserved um, and we can actually count back in, and determine how old that lake is and then we can look at the pollen that's in those lake virus. And here's a picture showing you each of those virus uh, in one small section. So using this information over various locations, we can produce a map such as this that you can see here. So this is um, a map showing you spruce, sedge, and pine distribution about 16,000 years before present. So um, if you visit some of the websites that I have linked up in the course um, video page, you should be able to see some of these um, animations. So this, this is a link that you should be able to download. Um, you might need a flash or quick time to see it. Uh, but it is pretty cool. You can see how these distributions have changed from today back to 6,000 years ago, and it's pretty significant. Uh, we can also produce graphs like you see here. We can look at the var of thickness, so is the pink graph, and then these other, the um, sagebrush, quartz, sodium, uh, all of these are showing you various other items that are present in that lake. So here we can see there's a pretty d uh, uh, low amount of sagebrush in this area, and it spikes up pretty pretty dominant for a while and then goes back down again. This is showing you how things have changed. So when we have climate shifts, different vegetation are um, able to adapt to different conditions. They'll, they're happier in specific climates. Sagebrush is usually a desert type or dry climate type of vegetation. So this would indicate maybe a wet to dry to wet conditions. So depending on where you get this data from, your graphs are going to look different because it's a different location. So these are pollens. Uh, we can also look at glacial ice. Um, there's a various studies going on. I posted a video link um, if you have the time and you're interested in um, how glaciers t give us uh, evidence for past and future climate change. Definitely check it out. It's a Nova video. It's about an hour long. Um, but basically, glacial ice. Uh, we can go to these various glaciers like. Greenland, Antarctica, and collect what's called a, uh, an ice core, which you can see here in these image, this image here. They've cored down into the ice and collected this sample. Here's a, a side view of a glacier that's exposed. So every year you get another layer of, of snow and ice deposited on a glacier, and we can see that in these horizontal layers in the ice, just like tree rings. We can also see in that ice we actually get gases or air bubbles trapped in the ice. And when uh, glaciologists study these different layers, they can actually melt the ice, extract all of those gases, and determine what our concentration of greenhouse gases were, which can also tell us the um, temperature 
of, of the atmosphere, so it can infer those climate conditions. So here you can see these are some graphs that are produced um, from these ice cores. So there's a few different things here. We've got um, oxygen isotope ratio that we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, grain radius, so that's um, referring to the ice, the dust present, and then we can um, have some uh, conductivity down here as well. So lots of information gathered from um, an ice core. And here you can see the depth going down, and then if they find a dust layer, uh, ash layer, they can give them a date. They can actually uh, determine um, the age of this ice. Uh, we can also count backwards in the layers as you move downwards in that core. So what is oxygen isotope? Ratio. So this is a way for glaciologists and oceanographers to infer past climate. So what happens? So um, we get, we can measure these oxygen isotope ratios in glacial ice, and also in um, the shells of organisms that were living in the oceans at that time. So the bottom of the ocean has layer upon layer upon layer of these organisms that were living at one certain time, and pulling oxygen out of the water and uh, calcium out of the water to build their shell. So we get that isotope, that specific oxygen isotope trapped in that shell. And then we see those layers built up on the ocean floor. So uh, we can take cores from glaciers, we can take cores from the ocean, and we can correlate the two of these, which is pretty neat. So um, basically we have two major isotopes of oxygen, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. If you've had basic chemistry, hopefully you recognize that um, Oxygen 18 is heavier because it has more stuff in it. That's why the 18 is there. And then oxygen 16 is lighter. Uh, so because of uh, the lighter nature of oxygen 16, it takes less energy to evaporate oxygen 16 out of the oceans. So when evaporation occurs, we have more oxygen 16 evaporated from oceans. Um, and therefore, we end up with um, more oxygen 16 um, in our rainwater. So if any oxygen 18 ends up in the clouds, because it's heavier, it's going to be preferred uh, preferentially by precipitation. So if we look, think of this in um, a glacial, non-glacial situation, uh, if we look at our ocean concentration, if we have oxygen 16 evaporated and then raining down on, on the surface, we have that oxygen 16 returning to the system because it's raining, it's infiltrating into the ground and eventually making it back to the oceans or raining back down on the oceans. So our oxygen 16, 18 ratio is pretty close. Um, during glacial times, temperatures are much cooler. Any of that oxygen 16 that's evaporated and then ends up in a glacier, it's trapped because it's n stuck, it's frozen. It's not going to melt off into the ocean. So we get more and more of that 16 pulled out of the ocean and deposited in those glaciers. So our oxygen isotope uh, ratio ends up being heavy in uh, oxygen 18 in the oceans because all the 16 is pulled out. And then the glaciers are rich in oxygen 16 because that's where it's being trapped. So we can look at these ratios over time, compare the ocean to the glaciers, and um, see these two records coincide with one another. Now we can also look at historical records um, of glaciers. So these are repeat photographs from 1928 in the upper left corner, um, 1979 in the lower left corner, and then 2000 in the upper right, and 2003 in the lower right. So this is showing you how this glacier has decreased in volume and size Oh, since 1928. So we can look at historical records of um, photographs of glaciers to help us interpret what's happened with the climate as well. These glaciers also leave behind glacial landforms that we'll talk about in a, in a few slides. So some other geologic evidence that exists are fossils. So if we look at an area, for example, John Day in eastern Oregon, or central Oregon, John Day fossil beds, Right now, that area is very dry, and it's a desert. But when we look at the fossils, we see tropical plants um, that represent tropical rainforest. Huge trees, huge leaves, um, really, really rich environment. Um, lots of precipitation, but now 
things are much different. So looking at the fossils that exist in there, it can help us interpret what things were like in the past as well. Uh, we can also look at fossil plankton, um, things like foraminifera and diatoms that exist on the ocean floor. So in those cores that are pulled up from the ocean floor, we can look at oxygen isotope ratios, and we can look at what type of uh, these critters, these plankton that were living at the time, because certain types tell us about uh, what the climate was like. They like certain conditions, just like certain types of plants like certain conditions. Um, so if we have more silica shells, that means we have cool conditions, more carbonate, we have warm. And we know that because that's what we see today. So we can look at um, what's being deposited currently in the Arctic and compare it to what's being deposited currently in the Caribbean or on the equator um, to get that information. We can also look at rock types, like I mentioned uh, before. Um, rock types will tell you all sorts of, of different things. So we can see fossil corals that can exist to tell you about marine conditions. We can see salt deposits giving you the idea that they're arid conditions because now we see salt deposits in dry environments. Um, we can look at, like this is from John Day, the Painted Hills has this very rich reds, purples, oranges, and that's because this is a soil layer rich in iron, uh, and the iron is oxidized. Thick, thick layers of soil I mean we have wet conditions. Uh, we can also look at things like sandstones to tell us a little bit about climate as well. So the rocks will tell you a lot. And then we can look at glacial evidence such as um, landscapes. So here we see Glacier National Park in Montana. This big U-shaped valley is a signature sign of glacial activity. Um, we see this kind of round topography in Maine, a sign of glacial erosion there. And then in Montana, we see these huge lake varves that were uh, formed as a result of the glacial lake Missoula that periodically um, uh, released into uh, the Channel Scablands and into the gorge as well. So we see all this evidence um, pointing towards cooler conditions in uh, the Earth's history. So we can compile all this data um, that we see and then in for what has happened in the past. And then because we have that evidence, we know things have changed based on what we see, we can start thinking about what caused those changes. And that's what we'll look at in the next video.